Um, what would be really nice is if uh, we could get a sense of who everyone is uh, and kind of why you're here. So if everyone could type in the chat box uh, who you are, where you're from, and kind of are you a new entrant? Are you an organisation that's looking to do a farm start? Like what, what's your interest in farm starts? That would be really nice. So if you could uh, just type in the chat box, that would be great. Um, and meanwhile, I will introduce uh, our kind of panel for this. So I'm Steph Weatherall. Um, I work for the Landworkers Alliance and I run the Farm Start Network currently. Um, so that means I uh, coordinate the network that helps support farm start projects around the country. Um, uh, I also work as a media and comms coordinator for the Land Workers Alliance and uh, also uh, run the mentoring programme as well. Um, additionally, I'm trying to start a farm start in Bristol, so I have a kind of double layered interest in farm starts. Uh, We've got Helen Woodcock, uh, who's one of the founding members of Greater Manchester's Kindling Trust, uh, which is working to create a fairer and more sustainable food system for Manchester and the surrounding area. Um, so she's helped establish the Farm Start programme, their community food hub, as well as uh, Manchester Veg People and Veg Box People, which are kind of trying to create fairer markets for organic growers and make local organic food accessible to all. Um, she's currently focused on establishing the Kindling Farm, which is going to be a 100 plus acre organic agroforestry farm for the Northwest. Um, and then we've got Ellen Pierce, who's been coordinating farm start work in Lancaster for the last three years, undertaking a feasibility study pilot programme and setting up a local funding scheme for the project. Um, she also co-chairs the Food and Economy Working Group for Food Futures, which is North Lancashire's sustainable food network. And she also coordinates the Northern Real Farming Conference. So uh, she's been hard at work uh, helping put this amazing conference on. Um, so the way we're going to run the session is I'm going to do a short little bit of an introduction, um, kind of what is a farm start, why is it needed, um, and then uh, I'm going to hand over to both Helen and Ellen to talk through their kind of northern case studies and then we're going to have a, a good amount of time for a discussion and Q&A at the end. Um, so without further ado let me just get my slides sorted. So I have a mini mini faff moment while I uh, get this going. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, sorry it's always a Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that, okay. Um, so I guess a good place to start is like, why do we need farm starts? Um, in 2017, a third of all farm holders in the UK were over the typical retirement age of 65. Um, I think the average age of a farm holder at the moment is around 60. Um, but more worryingly, the proportion of young people aged less than 35 was around 3%. Um, so what's kind of clear is that we need a new generation of farmers and we need a lot of them. Um, there's a huge amount of barriers for new entrants. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to access land, for example, massively inflated land prices to buy. Um, and a, a lot of people experience a really challenging time getting secure tenure if you're renting land. Um, there's a lack of appropriate training. You know, if you're talking about agroecological and organic growing, there's very little um, appropriate training uh, available to people. So how do you make that step from allotmenting or woofing to being a farmer? Um, it's really hard to establish routes to market, you know, on top of producing all the food, you're kind of also expected to work out how to sell it, how to deliver it, how, you know, and all of the kind of business skills that go with that. Um, and there can be really high startup costs. So if you're talking about starting with a bare piece of land, um, you know, are you going to need fencing? Is the improvements to the land needed? Are you needing poly tunnels? Are you needing tools? Um, and the aim of a farm start is to take away the kind of financial risk for people and to provide access to as many of these things as possible. So what is a farm start? Um, so in essence, it's a site or a project that supports access to training or mentoring, land, routes to market. Those are the kind of the key three that um, most farm starts try to cover, if possible, all three of them. But it may also include business support. It may include in equipment and infrastructure. It may include support moving on to another piece of land. 
Um, it may include a community of other farm starters or producers that that person can be part of. Um, the model started in the States um, and North America and currently there's about 100 different sites. They all look slightly different depending on the kind of opportunities and the uh, kind of challenges that um, are available to that region or area or organisation. Um, but it often looks like a piece of land that is then subdivided into small plots um, and then uh, sublet to people to come onto for often a specific period of time, maybe up to three years. So people can have a go at running a business. They get to take on a piece of land, maybe a quarter of an acre, maybe half an acre for growing, for example, to test out their idea, to get their practical skills up to speed, to learn the business skills they might need to, to run a business. Um, and often tied in with that is some training uh, that's kind of integrated within the project um, and support often through an existing route to market. Um, just trying to give people a, also a chance to test out their idea because you know, otherwise you go from having an idea to the, the point where, which you might have to invest a lot of money and time into doing something. Do you actually want to be a farmer? It's quite difficult to, to kind of test out that idea and a farm start really gives people the, the space and opportunity to do that. Um, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like a wonderful scheme. Uh, <laughs> what are the challenges? Um, the, how, how do you fund a farm start? Um, most of the farm start sites charge people for a piece of land and the training, but it's often at a much lower cost than the cost of delivering that. Um, and so most projects require some kind of additional funding uh, and a lot of the existing farm starts that are going so currently we have about we have four running in this country at the moment um, and a couple that are kind of, well, five uh, and then a couple that are in the process of being set up um, most of them are embedded within a wider project that the rest of the work can help support uh, the farm start itself um, accessing land uh, can be a challenge for a farm start site. Like in Bristol, that's our major issue right now is finding an appropriate piece of land. Do you go to a private landowner? Do you go to a local authority? Um, and how supportive they are of it? Um, you know, can you provide some training? What kind of training? Uh, you know, how do you how do you cover the costs of of that as well? Um, I'll come on to that in a moment about some of the work that we're doing within the Farm Start Network to help support that. Um, and how much support are you able to give your your farm starters? Um, are they are you providing access to the land and the route to market, and then they're on their own, or is the mentoring like how much interaction are you having with them? So there's a lot of different levels. You could have a very involved farm start, or you could have a fairly hands off approach. Um, uh, I'm going to talk in a second about a few of the different other options that aren't represented by Helen and Ellen in this country. Um, talking, touching on policy, there's currently no financial support available to new entrants in England. Um, so, and that's something that the Land Workers Alliance is really working on. Um, Scotland ran three capital grant schemes, but they've all closed. Uh, Wales also had a new entrance scheme, but it's closed, but they still do offer training and mentoring through Farming Connect. Um, the Agriculture Bill offers, does really offer potential for this to change. I mean, it's still um, going through the House, House of Parliament, so it's not confirmed yet. Um, the Landmarks Alliance have produced a policy paper, which I'll put a link to in the chat box, um, and are continuing to work on this. Um, there is definitely, I think, real potential for some support to come out, but we don't yet know what that might look like. It wouldn't, you know, ideally we could get some startup grants for people, we could get some support for training, we could get some support for land access, but the chances are we probably won't get it all. Um, but we are, active, we are actively working on that because I think um, it would really help facilitate more farm start projects being able to start around the country if there was some funding available from, a, from DEFRA to do this work. Um, so just to touch really briefly on a couple of different models, just to give you a br br brief idea. So organically in London, um, they offer a nine month farm start traineeship. Um, it usually follows on from people having done their level two city and guild horticulture training. So people have already had some training before they come into the traineeship at that point. So it fits really nicely within their kind of wider organization. Um, they do three months training and mentoring and then they have three months where they have a micro plot on the organic lease site 
and then three months of helping progress them onto their own land with which organically offers support with accessing that site through their relationship with the council. Um, they have an option to sell the produce that they grow through the organically uh, box scheme so that route to market is really easy if people do want to just sell through the box scheme um, and they don't charge for the traineeship or the land but they also don't provide infrastructure so the land comes kind of as is. Um, and then a quite contrasting model um, down in the southwest is Tamar Grow Local. Uh, they rent a 12 and a half acre field from a local landowner and have split it into one acre plots. Um, the landowner basically has said they can have as much land as they want so there's no need for people to progress off the land after a certain period of time. Um, they provide one year farm business tenancies with which people get a polytunnel, water and access to kind of shared barn and facilities. Um, there's currently no training um, offered as part of the scheme, but they would like to. Um, and there's access to market through the local food hub that Tamar Grow Local um, run. And tenants pay £500 a year for their acre of land. Um, just to touch a little bit on the Farm Start Network. Uh, so the Farm Start Network was started a couple of years ago um, by some of the Farm Start sites around the country um, as a way to help support the existing Farm Starts, but also help new potential sites be formed. Um, there's a lot of knowledge in the existing projects and a lot of learning. Um, one of the first things we did was produce a guide to setting up a farm start, uh, which I will also post the link to in the chat box, which is kind of full of information, a lot of questions you might want to ask, a lot of the history of it, several different case studies on different projects with more details. Um, and there's also a list on the Land Workers Alliance website of all the kind of existing sites and some further information. Um, the Farm Start Network runs as an email list at the moment, so we if, there's also information on the website about how you can sign up and be part of that. Um, so the aim is just to share knowledge, answer questions, and facilitate more sites. We're, uh, we're hoping to run more events and training this year, but obviously with COVID that hasn't happened, but that's still on the agenda. Um, we're planning one up at Kindling Trust next year. Um, and one of the major things we've been working on is developing accredited horticulture training using Organic Leaves model, um, which we are going to support being delivered through satellite sites across the country. Um, so Organic Lee use the City and Guilds framework, which allows them to access adult education funding uh, to run the courses, which means they can run them um, free or heavily subsidised for people. Um, and they've basically taken the City and Guilds horticulture framework and taught organic horticulture using that framework. Um, so our aim is to train up people from across the country into how to run that course, send them back across the country to their respective farm start sites or similar sites um, and support them to um, start running those courses and access the, their local funding to be able to do the same thing that organically are doing. Um, in the longer term, um, Land Workers Alliance are also looking at becoming an accredited training provider and uh, setting up a kind of appropriate level three or level four course as well. So there's lots of things around training in the pipeline, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's coming. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So that is the end of, oh dear, sorry. Uh, okay. That's the end of my little brief intro. Um, just picking up on a question that was just asked. Um, is it is our farm starts just about horticulture? Nope, not necessarily. Um, there's we found a kind of a couple of different sites that do include kind of animal husbandry and uh, raising livestock. They tend to look a little bit different. Um, one of the case studies in the guide is on Stream Farm, who are down in Somerset, who basically it's a 250 acre farm and they get people to come in on a share farming arrangement, so new entrants to come in on a share farming arrangement, and they take on one of the enterprises on the farm. So that might be the lamb, that might be the eggs, it might be the, um, the trout, it might, you know, one of those enterprises, and they run it and they get business support in how to do that, they get the practical support and shared infrastructure, um, and they also sell through a shared uh, route to market as well. Um, and that seems to work quite well for for that because a lot of the expensive infrastructure costs um, are covered by the kind of central farm and 
the way the share farming agreement works is that the central farm gets a chunk of the turnover and the, the farmer themselves gets a chunk of the turnover. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd suggest having a look at that. Oh, someone got, someone got a yeah, question. Yeah, it was me, it was me that asked that, that question. I was actually thinking about things like upland farming, um, okay. sort of things that require space. <laughs> big space and whether, whether uh, particularly up, upland farming I think is something that needs to change quite a lot in this country and it's new entrants that tend to challenge agriculture, existing agricultural models so I'm wondering where that sits within Farm Start. We, I think it would be really interesting to explore what a kind of Farm Start in kind of uplands farming might look like. Um, I'm not aware of anything at the moment that is kind of up and running, but I think it's something that's really needed and is something like as the network, I think we'd be quite keen to explore what that could look like and how that could work. Um, yeah, it, I would say it's quite a new model in this country and I think it's, it'll be really interesting to see how, how it does grow and expand. I know um, not so much up farming, but I know uh, Tamar Grow Local have, for example, a vineyard and have an orchard and someone keeping bees on their site. So it isn't just market gardening, although I do think the model does lend itself quite naturally, especially if you're talking in urban areas, to, to the kind of horticulture approach. But I think, you know, what does it look like if, if you've got more space? Um, I think is a really interesting uh, question. Um, okay. Uh, Helen, I'm going to hand over to you to talk a little bit about Kindling Trust. <laughs> need to unmute myself. Is that, can you hear me? Oh yeah, I can't hear any of you, of course. Um, so I'm going to, I'm Helen. Hello everyone. Uh, I am going to whiz through a little bit about what our model is. I'm going to share a screen with you. I just, I was interested in some of those questions that um, were coming up and I think there's some really interesting models in France as well, uh, where there's a lot more of a mixed, I suppose there's a mixed way of sharing their learning, but probably like more kind of livestock stuff as well. So this, it might be worth looking at the, um, what are they called? The Renata, Renetta, the, the network of farm starts. Uh, in France, anyway, <laughs> I can't speak French, so I'm rubbish at pronouncing anything. <laughs> anyway, and uh, also you asked about the agricultural links, the agricultural college links. Someone asked about that, so just to so I don't forget about that. Just to say, uh, we did go down that route of trying to have some agricultural uh, college links because we've got some uh, colleges in the northwest um, near us, and uh, yeah, it kind of for one reason or another didn't really didn't happen, but we tried to engage the ag colleges in doing like training on using tractors and that sort of thing and I think there was a lot of, there was some really supportive stuff and then uh, it was probably that we didn't have that much time either but it kind of didn't come off but I think it's a really great idea because I think where there's infrastructure and expertise if we can work together on stuff that would be really great um we were sort of told that there wasn't any interest in organic farming in those colleges, but we think that's because nobody talks about it. <laughs> so we think that's why it is. Uh, I think there will be. I think there will be. Anyway, I'll stop. I'll try and be a bit more uh, organised. So I've got some photos so you can look at those instead of my face. Uh, let me have a look. Uh, from the beginning. Um, oh. So I'm not doing it from the beginning. Oh no, my screen's, whoop, no, here it goes. Hopefully. Yes, is that working? No, it's still not from the beginning. Anyway, I'm going to, there we go. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, about our model and the bits that we find important, that we think are really important. I'm going to try and whiz through that uh Beth's already talked about all the kind of um challenges in terms of going into farming and that's sort of what motivates us to go into it and with uh with with our vision uh of what it is and with and where farm start comes from is very much about kind of a wider food system and uh kind of valuing the food and producer and all of those sort of things but also saying this is 
are very much about social justice uh, from both ends of the food system. So uh, we want the farmers to be paid properly, but we also want food to be accessible to everyone. Uh, we don't really want to be, well, we do work with restaurants a lot and they were the first sort of people that we worked with because chefs, you know, really appreciate good food and it felt like a really natural fit for growing food to be able to go to restaurants we also don't want it to be uh, only people that can afford to eat out of restaurants that get to eat our beautiful food we think that everyone should get to eat it uh, so um kind of how we how we do this through farm start we it's a different model to the one we're using at the moment with farm start um, and this is a picture of our first site and this is one that's very much along the lines of the model that Steph was talking about where we rented two acres from a farmer, an organic farmer that we knew um, that had some land that he wasn't growing on and we split that up into quarter of an acre sections and basically people took on a quarter of an acre, farm starters would apply to us and take on a quarter of an acre. Um, and the idea was that they we provided some training and that was a mixture of kind of classroom and practical training and then they came along and were trialing their business model and um, that they'd already thought about so it was very much people that had already had experience had you know done volunteering on farms had thought through what their market was all that sort of thing um and it, that was quite based on both on the farm start model in the states but also the french model where um it is about helping people to sort of set up a, a business idea um so this is the this is i'll kind of go into a little bit more detail well about the whole thing but that's uh that's to give you an idea and we did it in uh we did the site in long strips um so it was each each strip was a hun was a quarter of an acre and it was 116 meters long i think so when you when you were weeding your carrots and you got to the end you realized just how long that was because you had to start again by the time you got to the end um so oops oh, it's really gonna move all over the place now so our second uh site our second model is based on growing alongside uh an experienced grower and growing together as a group so the farm starters all work together rather than taking on their own bit of land and they um and they uh, yeah and basically they're it's sort of overseen by a grower um and the reason that we sort of went more down this route was because what we found with our first model uh was that people that they're just people there weren't that many people with experience to start at that level um, so so we kind of found that people would kind of get into the growing on their section of land and then kind of start looking panicking and looking into the what's our logo going to be or you know trying to find the market and we would just be saying you really need to focus on scaling up your growing and let you know improving your growing skills um, and actually when we then got offered this second bit of land which is a, a in a park in Stockport um, so it's quite a different place and it's a old uh, it's where they raised used to raise the the flowers for the all the you know the flower beds in the park um, and we got off of that and we decided to try it as a different model which was this one and loads more people applied for it um, and it and we did sort of feel like it's made possibly because of where we're based because we're quite urban based that that was sort of the level that people are at so this is this is what we do really now at the moment we don't do the first model although we would love to do both of them uh, and we'll do both of them so what we offer is a mix of uh, classroom and practical training um, and that hasn't changed that offer hasn't changed uh, with both of the both of the models so the classroom training in the first we sort of do three levels um, and we with the first model we said that people could stay with us for up to five years and then it would be move kind of moving off to, onto other land um with this because you're working alongside other people we kind of say sort of two to three years but we kind of encourage people to stay for more than one year <clears throat> if possible because you it's just so different when you're i mean most of you know this but every season can be different i could go to these trainings every year and still learn something new um, so we kind of encourage people to stay longer and it's about sort of providing a, a supported environment with a bit lower risk before you move off into setting up your own business. So the classroom training, we do a bit of crop planning, um, 
we do soil health, we look at organic standards and cultivations. And then it's very much because people are going quite often from learning how to grow, you know, in their own gardens or allotments um, to growing for a restaurant or a, you know, a box scheme, that's quite a scaling up experience. It's quite different. Uh, so it's kind of how do you do that? How do you kind of, yeah, how do you grow for someone who wants the same thing for their eight week menu cycle or whatever uh, so there's a lot of stuff around that um, and then over the years so that's sort of in the first level and then over the years it sort of carries on really encouraging people to look at their speed and trying to speed up so that they can actually make a living out of growing veg but starts focusing again on the finances and keeping track of that and the business planning as you as you kind of go on so the practical experience um we, say, we ask people to dedicate two days a week to the, our programme, which the classroom training is part of. Um, but it's kind of, you because part of the idea is to work out whether this is actually what you want to do before you plough your money and time into finding land and setting up your own business. It is sometimes in the year you are doing the same thing over and over again. But what we say to people is that's, you know, that's what it will be like and it will be even more because you'll be doing it on your own potentially <laughs> so uh so it is two days a week sometimes really repetitive but we do try and make sure that at lunch times you then sit down and have discussions you reflect on what the classroom training is and what you you know try and go back to what you learned in those classroom training and you we also then recognize that if you have the classroom training at the beginning you might not even know the questions to ask so we kind of then say later on okay let's reflect on that now you know a bit more what are, you know what are the questions you want to ask about pests and diseases or whatever uh, so we do that this is our beautiful site we also do farms visits so we do make sure that we do a couple of farm visits to other growers um, and that's about looking at different techniques different um, different sizes different scales of farm um, and just yeah just different people so our scale is our site is just a couple of acres um, some of the visits and, and we've got you saw in the last one that there are a few polytunnels but there's other growers that have like 80 acre sites that we go and visit or other ones that just do undercover um, and it's just really great to see really shit hot growers basically and it just makes you feel really excited and inspired so that's part of that as well so the market that's a really important part of farm start both um us providing a market and getting people to think about the market and uh, interact with the market because as a grower like we sort of say to people as a grower you, you, it's not just about learning how to grow it's kind of you have to be super organized you have to communicate you have to be able to do beautiful graphics and you know it's just like it's about doing lots of different things um so we also get people to sort of interact with our markets and we've got the the restaurants and the universities that are part of Manchester Veg People and then we've got the box scheme side of things as well um, and we also in terms of the fairness again I've talked about this already but the social justice stuff part of that's about uh, introducing the restaurants and the growers to each other so there's a bit of a connection there so we get them to come down to the farm the chefs come down and do a bit of a we did a cook-off on what's the most exciting thing you can do with Cole Rabbi or whatever and then we also did have done some projects with schools where we could try and make sure that you how do you get good organic food into schools and looking at their menus and stuff and then also in terms of the wider thing it's also how do you engage more people in it so we have a land army um, where we get people to come down to the site and get involved in that because actually if you're if you've got say four farm starters working a couple of days a week it's not it's just you've just not got enough days a week to get all the if you're trying to also produce a lot of veg to increase your increase access to veg but also to try and bring some income in to fund the project it's like how do you do that so we have we have a kind of big volunteer base but again it's also about that that is then really beneficial for people and it's about how do you someone asked about getting how do you attract growers into farm star and a lot of the way we do that is by having these volunteering opportunities and people can come and try it out just for a few days and some people love it you know and just love it as a thing to do every so often and other people really love it so much that they then go into come into the farm start farm start program like belinda in that picture and then the kind of just this is uh, the last one really on the model which is just kind of that 
the the second part the other part of that is that we're at Woodbank Community Food Hub we have a um other like community events going on we've got a social prescribing program that we try and kind of connect all that up people get a free veg bag and as part of the social prescribing program and it's all about just kind of yeah it's about saying this is this is about food justice and this is a wider a wider issue um than just sort of teaching some people to grow to be able to supply posh restaurants the finances uh this was just to give you a bit of an idea but i'm a bit worried that i'm talking too long how am i steph is all right all right uh so this is kind of just a little bit on the final design to the two sites were very different because when we um when the first site that we got we just approached all the farmers that we worked with already through managed edge people and one farmer came back to us and said i've got some spare land and i'd love it to be used for growing which was great um, but they had absolutely nothing it was a blank canvas really um so we put like compost loo in we had to get a kind of water take water access from the nearest from their the house no there was no storage there was no shelter uh, no polytunnels so so all of those things had to be put in place um and so we did get a well first of all when we no we did get a grant right at the start we got a little grant right at the start and then did it for a year on top kind of on top of other things and uh, and then applied for more money once we'd shown we did it when we got the wood bank site um it was because we'd already been doing quite a bit of work in stockport and we were asked by the council to go onto that site so there was already a lot of existing facilities there like including a cabin with toilets and there were a couple of polytunnels and different things and we didn't need a tractor because it was kind of a it was less of a field farm situation um, and we now try and do uh no-till anyway on that site um we did we have started investing more a lot of it you can kind of it depends where you're going really with it and where you where you want to go like you can spend less money or you can spend loads of money because you can you know there's loads of brilliant tools that you could get and the idea is to get help people try out different tools so once they start buying things they know what's their favorite type of hoe or their you know they all know that they love broad forks because who doesn't and all that sort of thing and teaching people how to put irrigation in place or how to set up solar panels to uh, to water your plants or so all those sort of things would be great so you could spend loads of money or you could do it really basically with hardly any money just how we sort of started originally um now i didn't fill that in <laughs> i have to confess maybe because i just ran out of time but this was just to give you a little bit of an idea of what of this what sort of things because there's the setting up and then there's running it and running it just it just does cost money because you if you want a um pay someone to run it and it's really good to have for us for in, in our model it's really important to have a coordinator um and there was a bit of time where the coordinator because we didn't have any money was only doing a couple of days a week and that was just really hard in this model because you because you are trying to train people and if you want it to be a good training project you kind of need to you know to invest in that and so the training we would really love to do the we're hoping to um, develop our models to the organically accredited training module because we think it's a really good idea because it just it's also something that will reach out to a, a, a lot more people we hope because actually a lot of our farm stars don't particularly want to be accredited they just want to learn how to set up a business and how to grow um and they and they don't necessarily need a certificate for that um but but to get more people in and attract a wider audience if you offer a qualification then people might more people might come to that as i hope and that also would would be a way of drawing down more money and funding us to do that and the other ways we get money are we we have had grants we do charge program fees so we charge um 500 pounds uh, for our program to be honest that doesn't even cover the cost of bringing in an external trainer so we get someone else in to do the like really experienced grower to run the classroom training and it just about covers that, I think. Um, our veg scales, we we want to really scale that up because the hope would be to kind of be able to fund more more of it from that. Um, but yeah, our grant our grant is what pays for it, and that's a lot based on our social prescribing scheme and our uh, our community activities and all that sort of thing. Uh, so it is yeah, it's very based on 
on doing other things. And then just quick last thing was just, we always like to end with actions, actions and things that people can get involved with. So we do, one of the things we do is a do you want to be a farmer session that's gone already, but I do recommend that if you're, if you're uh, starting a farm start is to before you before people even pl apply so we do an application process as well you kind of get them in a room and you try and put them off and uh and you make them feel they want to do it as well but you kind of go have you really thought about this because a lot of people are just like oh it'd be really lovely to go and live in the countryside which, which is still how i feel <laughs> <laughs> I have to say um but yeah so it's kind of bad talking about the hard, the hard realities and we quite often get a farmer in who uh and then some farm starters and just get them to answer questions about it uh we do crop planning every year in november then we have a farm start application deadline that comes up um we start at the end of january just with an induction we also do a four day commercial growers course either in spring or autumn which we're hoping to do so i don't know if any of you wants we do that if any of you want to come on that if that's useful then let us know uh we hope we'll be doing if everything allowing we'll do a sort of regional or even a national gathering in manchester at some point because that'd be great because that's really the the farm start network is really great and it's just a really great way to like steph's support has been amazing and just meeting up with each other and and kind of talking things through is so useful and we learn even though we kind of did the first one in the UK, we've learned absolute loads from everyone else that is setting them up and as they set them up and we love everyone else's models. When Steph was just talking about organically and take our growth, I was just like, oh, we want to do that as well. So that, you know, there's loads of ways we can improve what we do. And then the last thing is we're setting up, a, as Steph says, the, la the large scale farm, the kind of hundred acre plus farm. So we've got the launch of the community shares campaign for that in spring. And the hope for that is to set up an agroforestry farm start, which would be the first one for the Northwest. So we're super excited about that. So I think there we go. Beautiful, exciting picture of that to end on. And I think that's it. I'll hand over to Ellen. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got some slides as well. Okay, so um, so the Lancaster project is like, I mean, I was going to say we're at the start of our journey. We're two and a half years into our journey, but it still feels like we're we're very much at the beginning. So I was going to just sort of briefly talk you through, um, you know, the steps that we've been through to get something set up and where we are now. Um, and I think I could touch on some of the questions which have come up as well. So um, about two and a half years ago, maybe a bit more, uh, Less, which is a local community interest company, um, really wanted to do, like look seriously into the idea of a farm start programme in Lancaster. And I think in the chat, some people have been asking about like procurement and local hospitals. So I think there was a realisation that um, lots of the local anchor institutions were starting to think about growing locally, uh, sorry, buying locally, procuring local food. And we we're really aware that there was very little to be had. So we wanted to look at, you know, partly it was about capacity building, um, even though this is obviously will take a long time to, you know, to come to fruition. So less uh, crowdfunded for the some money to pay for a feasibility study. And that's where I got involved. So I did the feasibility study. And I was essentially looking at three key questions. Um, one is what, sorry, one was, do local companies still want to, like, want to buy local food? Is the demand for more local produce? Secondly, um, are, do local people want to train to be growers and have this kind of career stroke lifestyle? And the third is like, what, yeah, what do we need to put around this project? Who are the partners and stakeholders? And what would we need to do to make it happen? And we created out of that a 10 year vision, which was very much about having a ring of small scale producers in the district um, and around Lancaster City, and also about working very collaboratively um, in a similar way that other organisations have done. So working with the organic and local farmers and distribution networks that are already in place so that we didn't, you know, inadvertently um, unseat someone else or, you know, we wanted the whole, we want the whole system to work. So we really wanted to make sure that we um, had you know worked on making the system work um 
and then by so that was the first phase essentially and then in the autumn I did a load of fundraising so it, it felt to me really important to keep the momentum going and we decided to do a pilot course because I'd had all these people responding to my survey saying that yes they wanted a, wanted a career in farming um, and you know various stakeholders were excited about it so I really wanted to do something to um, make that happen so I got to I think it was about two and a half or three thousand pounds from a trust fund um, and we ran a pilot program in uh, 2019 so this was a six-month program it was very much a taster um, it it was focused around six one-day farm visits um, and we budgeted to pay the farmers for their time because that's one of the other challenges um, we tried to make it very accessible so it was it was very cheap to um, have a place there and we also had quite a number of bursary places so we did have some we have like a refugee and asylum seeker growing project in Lancaster and we did have some representation from those communities so we I'm not sure how well we did it but we did we did try and you know make the opportunity as sort of open as possible to as many people as possible um, and then by autumn I was that was um, completed and and I was back on fundraising and site seeking so we did uh, in a sort of similar way to killing, I think we did we we did talk to the council and we did have um, a sort of agreement in principle to use uh, one of their sites uh, about just over a year ago, um, and that's a, a bedding plant nursery that had some spare capacity essentially. So there are two sort of there's poly tunnels, two poly tunnels that are currently need to be skinning but are, are available to be used. Um, but we're still going through the process of getting that confirmed. And uh, by spring of this year, uh, we were, yeah, we were really keen to find a site. And maybe one other thing to say is that we, we did actually have a social, we do have a social investor locally who is actually happy to buy um, a smallish field, six or seven acres for the site. Um, but, and we have had two sites which um, have, you know, have looked perfect in many respects and then fallen through for various reasons so it has been quite challenging to find um yeah to find a good site um but in the early in the year i put an advert out through the nfu mailing list and um, had a positive response from a local organic dairy farm uh, a few miles um, south of lancaster so we've actually taken over now uh it's just under one acre um site on their farm um it's really it's really nice it's really complimentary they have um like a play bar and it's very sort of family focused they have a cafe so they have lots of get lots of people on site they do school visits and um, so we're hoping that that will play a you know that that will help with the education element of the, the farm start site we also got some grant funding which meant that i could um work at a one day a week which was also quite key because up until then i've just been working for you know maybe a few hours at a time trying to trying to keep the project alive and partly what i was able to do with having that extra time was to set up um, a fundraising scheme which we set up called food friends which i'll just say a little bit about because our aim is not to be reliant in the long term on grant funding although we have um, been gratefully in receipt of a lot of grant funding to to get up and running so where we are now is that we we're trying to recruit a grower we've got some um, funding in place for the grower for the first year so this would be a four day a week role and our hope is to yeah to recruit the grower get the site set up this autumn and then um, begin our farm start scheme in january and we're also hoping to finally agree the um the agreement with the council so that we have that as our indoor and um, plant raising site and then we use that in conjunction with our outdoor space and maybe just to mention that um, this project is very much linked into the Food Economy and Procurement Working Group, which is part of our Sustainable Food Cities um, network. And that, you know, just having that group behind the project has been really helpful as well. So this, oh, this is our site. Yep. So it's uh, it's essentially two paddocks. They've um, very little done to the sites they're, they're really small it feels very manageable you know you can see it. it's got this beautiful restored uh, shepherd's hut on the site um, and yeah there's a link there if you wanted to uh, look at some more information and then just to say about the food friend scheme so um, yeah Helen gave an indication of um, budget so we also have a three-year budget uh, sort of business and development plan and we've had a lot of debates about um, you know who 
who should pay who in this scenario? Um, should we, should the farm starters be paying us for the education or should we be paying the farm starters for two days a week of labor? And it's a really, yeah, it's a really um, a difficult uh, or, you know, or an interesting um, inquiry, I guess. And in an ideal world, we would like to be paying our farm starters a bursary because we would like to make sure that that's accessible to people. And we know that, you know, this, kind of training seems to appeal seems to appeal to quite a lot of women and quite a lot of people who are doing multiple part-time roles and that the added strain is of accessing this kind of training is quite a barrier however we have to obviously fundraise to be able to to, um, to achieve that so um, so we've we've launched um, essentially a small society lottery so we were looking for an option where many people could contribute and it was a fairly sort of stable and sustainable funding source and we didn't have to keep keep going through the grant <laughs> writing hoops so um our, so the model for this is that um yeah people contribute five pounds a month or 60 pounds a year to be an, uh, to be a food friend or a member of our scheme um it's a yeah it's registered with the local council um we can have up to 500 members and then we draw six winners a month and we're giving 30 pound local food vouchers. So the aim is to both drive business to, you know, our local partners, like our local health food shop that's helped um, support the Farm Start scheme and to promote, you know, to promote uh, procurement of local food. Um, but, but at the same time, yeah, it's overtly a fundraising scheme. And if we were able to get to our target of 500 members, then this would easily fund our plan, um, you know, every year and hopefully be, yeah, be fairly sustainable because you're probably not going to lose everyone. You know, you might lose a few members every year, but you're unlikely to, to you know, to, to lose a lot of people in one go. So, yeah, so that's where we are. Um, we're excited to get our grow in place and looking forward to getting our first um, farm start farm starters underway. Brilliant. Thanks, Ellen and Helen. Um, I've had a bunch of questions coming up while these guys have been talking, so I'm just going to um, go through and try and pick up on them all and get Helen and Ellen and my kind of thoughts on them. Um, so there's a question as to whether organically we're given any financial support. Um, the way the adult education funding works is that um, you get paid kind of per learner they're able to access um, part of a local college's adult education uh, contract which are big they're big big contracts but they've worked with this college for a while um, the the drawdown funding they're able to access basically is more than the cost it, of delivering the training um, there's also there is an administrative kind of burden that goes with that so it works if you're at a certain scale we're only a certain amount of courses but what that means is that it becomes an income source for organically to then be able to run the farm start kind of traineeship free of charge and I'm pretty sure that their council doesn't charge them rent don't, don't quote me on that but I don't if they pay rent it's not very much but I have a feeling that the bits of land that they use they don't they don't pay rent on so that's how they're kind of able to do and that's why we're looking at the city and guilds model is that that could potentially become an income source that could help support farm starts around the country as well i think helen's got something to say on as well yeah they do, they were also funded by uh esme fairburn for about three years i think or yeah to set up yeah set it up so i think that's how they got their for their sort of first farm start sites and supported those first farm starts yeah and I think that's a key way that they get their farm starters as well. And I think that's also part of our vision. I think at the moment it's all the all the networks do their own kind of publicity of the farm start projects within different local networks. But I think through doing the training, that would see a lot of people who would come along and do a level one and then might do the level two. And then I'm like, oh no, I am quite serious about this, and then would move on. And the farm start is the next kind of logical step, um, I guess, in that chain. Uh, question about women. Uh, there's a lot of women in, in the photos. Does this model attract a, a, a female workforce? Helen? What do you think? It really interestingly, ours changes all the time. So last year we had all men, it, and it's really even 
because and I I really loved the photo that uh, that was up because it of those women because we were like yeah you've got women this year because it was all men last year so it's actually been quite even for us although I know Ellen said it's not been that way for them. Yeah, I don't know. We had more more people res more females respond to the initial survey and then more females on our course, but we've yeah we've only run one thing so far. But we were it certainly made us particularly mindful of you know, just looking at like timing and dates and, you know, considering school run and childcare and things like that as well. I mean, with either gender, that was a factor, but um, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, a couple of questions around kind of accessibility um, and barriers to entry. Um, from, I think most of the kind of farm starts that are up and running on people don't do it full time. So the aim is to like, can they trust it's two days a week? So people work around that. Um, it definitely is like an issue um, around that, but it's it's a, it's a real challenge because there's no financial support from the government. You know, I went on a trip to France last year to go and see the uh, the French incubator farm network, and in France, you can access basically if you're training to be a farmer, you can access benefits for up to three years. Uh, the farm start itself is funded, like the organisation is funded. There's like, a, you know, there's load, land is rented a, a restricted price. So it's like, it's a completely different framework. And I think at the moment we're, we're working within a really challenging situation to try and get this working. I think what Ellen's doing in Lancaster is really interesting to try and remove some of those barriers. I think what Organic Lee is doing is really interesting. Like the City and Guilds course for a lot of people is free because of the adult education funding and is heavily subsidised even if it's not free. Um, and because they're and then they're able to offer the farm start for free so I think you know it's it's something we're working towards I think we really are keen to see it and like the LWA are looking at how we can do more work around reducing barriers of entry to BAME and BIPOC people to try to really encourage participation and if we can find some funding we want to run an entire project kind of based around that and looking at that in more detail uh links to government or hospital procurement helen you you guys in manchester do some procurement stuff don't you we, we do so we um have tried but i think there was sort of examples of yeah you, the universities the local authority and the hospital and we have tried sort of all of those avenues the university we've got a really brilliant relationship with um the and both all of the universities now actually and that was just really through approaching people and finding the right people um what i would say is definitely try and embed your relationship kind of wider than one person so we were introduced somebody at the university and then he introduced us loads of people so once he he left because people do move on we were in with his boss and other people and the head chef and all of that sort of thing so that was really great whereas the one of the local authorities we worked with right at the beginning um when that person left that we weren't in with the other people and the other people weren't really that interested uh in organic food so that was a bit of a shame and so we lost that contact so it can be and you and the hospitals we kind of went for a few meetings are all our hospitals the the meals are managed by um who's this circa or someone someone some big massive so it's just like they invited us to for a meeting and then made all the right noises and then it's just we've never managed to get in there um it's sodexo isn't it that's what it is anyway uh but yeah so it's it is possible so i think a lot of people there were a lot of obstacles brought up when we first tried to work with them in terms of procurement with the local authorities and sustainers done loads of a really interesting work around procurement and why there aren't obstacles so we were able to come back with all of that and all the people that have done amazing work and how you change menus and without putting the price up and all that sort of thing so there is all that evidence out there um and like the university manage it by saying okay we've got a tendering kind of a, a kind of lower limit before which we have to go out to tender and we can therefore choose to work with you and source from you up to this amount of money so there's ways you have to basically it's about finding someone that's really into it and using the examples like asked and other people that are doing there's some really interesting examples out there and using using those to get in there uh, yeah, did, peter just did you have a 
direct question to that. No, I, it's, I, I want, wanted to add to that. I mean, in, in County Durham and in quite a lot of other um, local authorities now have sustainable procurement policies and, and are moving in the right direction thanks to um, their thinking about climate change. So there is, there is definitely a willingness within the local authorities to, um, to be more open to um, buying stuff locally and, and as I said in the chat our relationship through Food Durham with both the um, the county council procurement teams and um, the university and a large local museum is really positive and they've done a lot of work but things like um, veg and stuff like that is very difficult to get in our case um, so that is one of the reasons why I'm here I'd, I'd be interested in a bit like Alan um, interested to, to um, to develop a situation where there's more um, supply. There is a demand, but, but the supply is, is currently just missing. That's exactly what we experienced in Bristol as well. Like, you know, we, like a lot of restaurants in the city don't uh, buy local veg because there isn't any, like all the veg schemes are set up to sell uh, kind of direct to customer and there's very little capacity to sell in. And also added to the fact that delivering to restaurants is a whole different kettle of fish as Helen can <laughs> can talk about in Manchester and I, I know that's not procurement but still like we're, we have a massive demand uh, shortage in terms of larger scale in Bristol. Helen. Um, I suppose just one other thing to quickly say on that sorry about the sort of selling as farm start selling to a, a kind of public procurement situation or any kind of large buyer um, it's a really tricky one and the model that we first had with the sort of very, everybody having their own land because then people would grow different things and have quite small amounts at the start that's quite hard that's quite hard to manage and basically one of the one of the reasons for Manchester Veg people is that large institutions don't want to deal with lots of different little growers and, may, and maybe that's different in some situations um, and some areas but it but it's one of the things that we faced that made us set that up and uh, it, it just makes it a lot easier. So with Farmstar, we can do the same thing. We can sell into Manchester Veg people or we've obviously got the direct relationship with Vegbox people and we crop plan with them and all that sort of thing. But it just makes it easier for those big institutions to access you as smaller growers, I think. Uh, oh, Katie, have you got something to say? Uh, you no, know, I was just thinking about, I mean, I actually put it in the questions, but has anyone considered like a cooperative growing model you know like i know in spain there's a lot of agricultural cooperatives where everyone owns a share and then obviously you're all growing the same things which helps with things like procurement and things. i wonder whether anyone in farm start is looking at that kind of model um so I, so in a way that's not as farm start but with managed veg people that's kind of that's sort of what that came from as well was about um was get so it's a co-op of growers and buyers and workers so the growers are lots of uh, different small scale growers or or up to you know a few hundred acres or whatever growers locally organic growers and uh, and farm style is one of those so we can feed into it like that and the idea is that we all crop plan together so that we work that we kind of cooperate rather than compete with each other and that's kind of where it came from because there's so few in a sense there's so few growers up here in the northwest organic growers um that then it was really mad because they would all compete over the same thing just because we were we they weren't talking to each other and then it was just like wow there's so much room for all of us to be <laughs> growing and not competing with each other so that's kind of where that came from i think there's some really interesting other models with that and like community supported agriculture like um it was reminding me a little bit of that when you were talking ellen about your about the food friends scheme of that's a way in france where they how they fund things and how they manage to pay the growers because we would really love to pay the farm starters obviously because it is time and but it's just like how do you do that and also provide those and that's a kind of csa model is a really interesting one potentially i think Brilliant. Uh, we've got a question about organic certification. Um, how much kind of as a rough percentage of total costs is the cost of certification? Um, you did quite an interesting thing, Helen, uh, your first site around certification where you got a group certification. So, yeah, we were basically we just we certify the 
land so originally our certification at um at abbey lays was just theirs was the farmer's certification but then we took our own separate certification it's, it was a it was a tricky one we kind of negotiated it with the soil association so it is we have we're with the soil association and wood bank that's really easy because it's just us and, and us and trainees on the other site it was more difficult because there were lots of growers in a sense they should all if you get certified as a one organization you have to sell it as that organization and not lots of different growers so i know it but we sort of followed i think growing communities had maybe argued for that with their patchwork farm uh, type thing was that you get group certification i don't i don't know how much how into that they would still be doing it but definitely it was a possibility and they let us do it but we did have to sell it as farm start with people's names in brackets or their business in brackets rather than selling it as their individual business without farm start because it yeah how, how much does that make sense uh we pay about 400 i think it's about 400 pounds um so as a percentage it's quite a low percentage <laughs> i don't know what it is sorry that's a really rubbish answer but uh, you know of all of our costs if you think about how much a, a wage costs and we only pay campaign for living wage rate rather we don't pay we can't pay any higher than that um to all of our staff all of us but so compared to that it's a tiny proportion and for us we feel like it's really important for selling in a city and selling to restaurants or universities or wherever we feel like it's really important to have organic status if you're selling direct to your customers then and you've got that relationship and they can see how you're producing you might not feel you need certification but for us it's also part of shouting about organic and about how that's it's really really important and supporting kind of campaigning around organics but that's that's yeah it just works with our model brilliant uh next question is uh have you noticed if there's been an increased interest in getting into farming in the wake of covid um it's interesting because in Bristol, I feel like we have, like we have a, what is a land seeker survey for anyone who's looking for land to fill in. And we had like an absolute flurry of applications of people who had absolutely no experience, um, who were like, yeah, I want five acres of land. Uh, I'm going to like start a farm, grow some vegetables, <laughs> sell it into the city because we need it. But it was interesting that it was pretty much all coming from people who hadn't, who had very little experience. I don't know if Helen or uh, Ellen has any insight into that. I don't know that we've probably captured that, but we did have a lot of people volunteer to help. Uh, so like the Food Futures Network, um, we put out a request for volunteers and we had like 70 people come forward and offer their services. And I know partly that was like people on furlough who wanted to do something. Um, you know, and we've just, like, we've just set up a gleaning network. So yeah, I feel like it's certainly heightened heightens general awareness um, whether or not that translates directly into people wanting to I don't know join the scheme I'm not sure yeah we found we interestingly because same thing we had a lot more interest in our box scheme we had like loads of volunteers signing up for the land army volunteers which was which was quite mad because we were meant to, the site couldn't be open particularly to new people straight like we had a lot of regular volunteers coming and did all the distancing and all that sort of thing um farm start we had so we did a do you want to be a farmer session last week and there was about 22 people came which i thought was quite interesting considering that people we just had the rule of you're not allowed to <laughs> you're not allowed to go and do anything social we were like it's not social and it's training so it's fine but people still came and i but i asked people that question um that was it uh, was this as a result of lockdown and actually they all said uh that none of them said that it was but it was things that they'd been thinking about for ages and this had i think this had given them the moment to really reflect on it so i think I think people felt like no it's something they'd wanted to do forever in a way or for a long time but definitely we've had more interest in food and volunteering and all that sort of thing and I, I yeah I do think it's I think people have really reflected on values and life yeah. I would say. <laughs> um, so Matt's just put in about Kickstarter which is the government's new scheme to help unemployed young people find meaningful work so they pay for a six-month placement for unemployed young people 
um, and he's put a link to his email there. Um, I would also say the Land Workers Alliance are looking at this as well and as to whether the Land Workers Alliance could act as, a, kind of, could administer this. Um, so I'll also put my email address in the box and if anyone's interested, we will be sending, I think we're sending out a survey to our members maybe in the next week to see whether we can kind of get 30 people because I think in our minds it could pay quite well for people to be paid to do a traineeship um, and uh, also relate into some of the training stuff that we're already doing um, and develop that work we've just got to work out whether <laughs> kind of whether we have the capacity to to do all the administration of it as well um, and it, it's a funny one because it, it removes some barriers to entry but I think because it's going through the job centre it also for some people adds in um, you, people have to be on universal credit and then I think that also rules other people out from um, entry so yeah but I think it's a, it's a definite opportunity um, a question about projects in Scotland and someone's already responded yeah, yeah Locavor and Glasgow do something um, they are on the website they're linked to on our website um, as one of the projects um, I don't think it's running this year, the kind of farm start, but they're the only one I know of in Scotland. So it's definitely worth checking in um, with them. Uh, Helen? Used, oh, just Nourish used to do one as well, I think. But uh, I think yeah. that's, and they, what did they call theirs? It was really lovely. Making local did, work. Is it that one? What was it? Was it the Making Local Food Work one? Or making a living I'm not sure I think they did it since then and they but they had it more that you were already on farms and then you came together at a weekend so that suited quite well I think I completely forgot about this but the question about the upland farming type farm start model um, and it was uh, so people would just like be on farms and then be able to meet on a farm and come together and learn something over a weekend and do stuff and it that just suited people that were out kind of in rural areas of Scotland it was a really interesting model but yeah I don't know they and they also gave us access to loads of their stuff when we were setting up in terms of what their program was and their all their information they're amazing they're great Okay, here we go. Um, making a living from local. Oh dear, wait, hold on. Sorry, I'm just trying to do something and failing to, failing to do too. <laughs> um, uh, uh, da, 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 uh, making a living from local food. They didn't get funding to run it again, but there is an active Facebook group. Um, I've also put a link to the local project in um, in there as well. Uh, da, 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 uh, if there was a better standard than organic based on nutrient density that did not cost anything, would that be of interest? Um, I do you know what? It's really difficult because I think there's, I think there's, I think there's loads of labels <laughs> at the moment. Like there's, like we are also. So our site is a is a stock free site. So we are also certified by uh, Vegan Organic Network, um, and they've and they've kind of talked about we putting labels on food. And I've I actually really am like oh I'm totally supportive of it as a way of growing. But I just think adding another label, I'm not sure. It makes me nervous because I just feel like people are already you know a bit overwhelmed by stuff so I'd, we I'm, it was really interesting when I did my, my sort of farming course I, I felt like that you can organic has a really like wide line but like a spectrum of you can be really really brilliant at it and best practice and then there's the other end of it where you can just do the standard sort of thing so I suppose what I feel is with organic like let's push to make everyone who's being organic farmers like really really good at it and go with that one and try and link it in but i also understand i also understand that it can be prohibitive as a cost um yeah and the like the vegan organic ones are up here farming and you don't have to pay for it so you go and look at each other's sites so yeah i don't know it's interesting i think we would probably for now stick with organic just because it makes sense to us but it'd be interesting to know what other people Probably something similar for us. Like we're on a we're on an organic farm, and so that was like, you know, that was kind of a part of it's part of our like tenancy agreement to maintain the standards. So um, yeah, so we're 
definitely we're definitely bought into that um i'm not sure there could be there could be value in others but yeah i think we're we're just still getting going really i mean in, in bristol we the land we're getting to do the training on is on an allotment site uh, and so like certification isn't really an option um so yeah that's a it's a challenging uh thing really but i don't i don't really think there's a way around it for us i think the challenge is finding something that people trust um and there's problems with every label that's the thing um like there's definitely problems with the organic label but i know there's a bit of efforts being made to label regenerative as well which is an even more complicated and difficult to label thing um so yeah uh I'm not really sure that was a very helpful comment. <laughs> well, it's interesting though, isn't it? I think we need to reclaim organic and, or claim, reclaim what it is because I think there is a real view that it's expensive and it's elitist and, and whatever. And I, I feel like it's like, no, we all have the right and the, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, that's just, I, I feel quite like that every I don't know. Uh, so there's a little conversation going on in the chat box around um, kind of housing development. Uh, so uh, Kate, outside Edinburgh, developers are required to pay. So you have, they have to. Yeah, hold on. Uh, Kate, I don't know if you want to explain. Uh, unmute yourself and explain. It. That might be easier. Hi. It's Julian here. I'm Kate's partner. <laughs> She's working next door. Couldn't join. Anyway, so we're smallholders just outside Edinburgh in Midlothian, and um, lots of new housing estates being built. Uh, Midlothian has got more houses than Scotland being built than anywhere else. Um, and there's an opportunity, I think, to tap into some of the money that new homeowners are required to pay on an annual kind of maintenance contract with the developers. I think that lasts for about three years. If you do the sums, 100 houses, that's about 40,000. If you just get a bit of that, you can employ a grower on each housing estate. Because at the moment, the latest thing is, is planting a few apple trees and doing a suds kind of thing, the rest of it. Um, but there's no food. And everyone in those housing estates being green, green belt has to drive to local shops. So the idea is to talk to the Midlothian Council to see whether they can do something through planning gain. Um, to try and get developers not just to pay for roundabouts, roads and schools, but also um, growers, part-time growers at each housing estate. That's the basic idea. And I'm going to be having conversations this coming year, so which is why I've joined this particular session. I think there's a couple of different points that people have put in. Um, uh, Katie put one then about contributions to local projects that developers have to pay and whether that could be used, uh, the community infrastructure levy, whether that could be used to access to help fund projects. And Maddie's just put something in about the Manchester Borough of Thameside. Uh, Maddie, do you want to talk a little bit about that rather than me just reading out your... <laughs> Unmute yourself. Uh, hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just, uh, I'm helping to do some work with the Urban Agriculture Consortium and we had a, recently had a, a conversation with um, a couple of people from Tameside Borough Council who, who sort of proactively approached us to say how do we integrate food growing into this master plan and it was just a conversation they were telling us about that development for yeah, 110 hectares, it's sort of infill between a couple of um, uh, uh, quite deprived housing areas. And they're, they're really being very visionary about how they integrate housing, um, how they build houses and the quality of those, but the quality of the spaces between and how they function to support community. And so they're bringing, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's a return of, of they want social capital, they want to build ecological capital, they want to return hope and inspiration and vibrancy to that area. Um, and they think that the integrating food into it in a meaningful way will really help with the, that whole, that across that whole area to ease some of the deprivation of the neighbouring areas too. 
No, that's that's it really. Maddie, who are you who are you with? Are you when you were saying they approach you, are you part of a group? Um, so it's a it's a project. It's called an Urban, Urban Agriculture Consortium um, UK wide. It's got three years of funding from Esme Fairburn, um, and we we just sort of I've just been working on it for the last few months, um, and we're starting in kind of phase one, if you like, with a sort of working with a, a cluster of northern um, settlements. Um, and exploring working very sort of flexibly seeing how to add value to all the amazing stuff that's already going on how, by linking things up and um, sharing best practice and um yeah early days but we're having some lots of very interesting conversations great and are you in touch with operation farm in that's tame site no maybe give me a maybe give me a shout or something and i can introduce you if you want yeah to. Yeah, because I did mention kindling to them as a as a sort of go to for more expert and more local um, advice on it. Um, and yeah, I we haven't. I sent them lots of bits and pieces and haven't heard from cool. them since. But um, yeah, I'll um, put them in touch with you, shall I? Yeah, that'd be good. Not till next week. <laughs> mad week mad week yeah um how what's your how should they contact uh, well, you I'll just put, yeah just message it to you yeah i'll message it to you um we've got about 10 minutes left um does anybody have any kind of further questions or things that they'd um like us to discuss uh, i think you can probably just unmute yourself and ask as well if that's useful How many, how, uh, do any of you think that you will set up farm starts out of interest? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but not straight away. <laughs> I'm really, really interested in the farm start <clears throat> program. I think it's just fantastic. What I'm hearing today is just music to my ears. Such a positive project. Um, we're, we're, we're only just setting out as a, as a new not-for-profit, but I mean, I just see the biggest potential of getting people back onto the land is starting them small, easing it in, easing them into it, building community around it. Yeah, it's, it's just, oh, it's just fantastic. Um, and as we are about to start growing nutrient-dense food in the UK, so it's an active um, choice to grow nutrient-dense food, um, we've got some learning to do, and verifying that it stands up to the claims that are, are, are being made. But if we can do that, then we want to engage people in learning how to grow nutrient dense food. And I think the Farm Start programme is just like, that's where you could start off. And all my conversation about the organic certification, I've always questioned the disadvantage for small scale growers to grow high quality food, attract a really fair price, um and with organic certification i feel that that's a barrier that you need to be a certain size or you need to be a cooperative that's good thinking a smart one helen um the idea of nutrient density is that we can begin to to measure it and that's what our session is looking at is measuring nutrient density so we can already do it but it's really crude but we, we're teaming up with um, the bfa in america who are developing a little handheld spectrometer that um we'll be able to test nutrient density in real time so in terms of certifying quality it's the customer who can certify the quality if they have access to one of these devices um the ultimate end point is to have it as an app on the phone so everybody everybody would have access to measuring the quality of the food based on its nutritional content now the only way to grow nutritious food is organically um and it, 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 it's another um, issue that I have with some of the organic food production um, is that there's a lot of variation in the nutritional quality. So the best farmers produce the best food and it is going to be 
uh, nutritionally complete. But you know that if you go to the supermarket and find something organic that's been lying around looking a bit sad, it's certified organic, but it might not contain all the nutrients. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop because that is part of what I'm talking about on Monday. But it's an exciting new development. And the thing about labels is it doesn't need a label. It needs a story to be told, a background story. And enabling people to measure that quality for themselves means no need for labels. So it reduces confusion and cost. Okay, thanks. Oh, I was planning to leave about an hour ago, but I couldn't help myself. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I had a, a question for Ellen. Um, just because you said you're sort of pretty much voluntarily doing this, I think, one day a week, is that right? And, and so what, oh, maybe not, sorry, I misunderstood. What's your, what's your background and why did you get involved in this? I guess that goes to all three of you, possibly. Like, why did you become involved in this in the first place and what keeps you going? Um, so my background's more in kind of, sort of manage or a broad sort of management charity sector and sports development type background um and uh yeah we moved to Lancaster like four years ago and I was so I was kind of looking I suppose I was looking for a, a career change in a sense anyway um and I'd been involved in the Cambridge Sustain Sustainable Food um, Network in Cambridge um so when the feasibility study um kind of opportunity came up I, I felt like yeah I didn't have a background in growing or farming but I did have the skills required to kind of you know do the scoping and get, win the funding and sort of drive the project forward so um yeah so it's yeah I think it's an area that I've wanted to work in I wanted to kind of use my skills in something that seemed more important than what I've been using them in before I suppose <laughs> and I feel like this is a this is um yeah this is crucial right now um so yeah so I've, i so i like lots of other people have sort of a, a, a portfolio of things that i do i also do some sport development jobs and i i have always been paid for the farm start work but it's been at times very piecemeal you know like okay you've got 20 hours for the next i don't know three months you know just to kind of keep it going um but from may yeah i i was employed three days a week to do the farming conference and the farm start which just made a massive difference um, for me, I, I spent a couple of years farming in Canada when I was travelling and realised, I mean I knew right from the start I didn't want to be a farmer, but I really was passionate about local food and I felt that my skills were more useful in helping farmers and supporting farmers. Um, and when I came back I ended up working for an organisation called Bristol Food Producers, who I still do a day a week for, which is a kind of network of local farmers and producers. and all the way up the supply chain kind of to retailers and restaurants um kind of trying to increase local food production and through that just uh really came to understand the barriers facing new entrants um started to get interested in farm starts met helen um maybe through that maybe through broad new entrant work um and kind of did a feasibility study for bristol and then got the job with the landworkers alliance um and then kind of growing on that started a mentoring program uh, for new entrants uh, it's kind of trying to part of trying to see new entrants all the way through I guess um, yeah and then got sidetracked by media and comms <laughs> along the way <laughs> so, um, yeah so I'm not um, I'm actually not gonna be doing the farm start network job um, for much longer because I have too many jobs um, but I'm gonna stay involved with my Bristol kind of farm start hat on um, but we're, we're going to be recruiting very soon for someone to run the Farm Start Network and someone to develop the training. So if anyone knows anyone great, send them my way. Um, and I, I, I came from more sort of community work and doing, well, I don't know, mix of doing activist stuff. So I was sort of kind of weirdly went into the roads protest thing without really realizing it and then uh and then gardening with kids but didn't really know gardening with teenagers but didn't really know anything about gardening so they taught me quite a lot and then I really love food so I got into that side of things 
and now I'm totally obsessed with soil. So like, yeah, don't know, who knows where it came from, some kind of, but, and, and just met really great people along the way. And they, yeah, I guess that was, I'd, I'd rather be doing this than, than anything else. And yeah, gives you a lot of hope, I think, doing this sort of thing. And I would absolutely love to be sitting in a pub with you all and finding out what you all do. But I think that we uh, have to, do we have to stop? Uh, you might be a few minutes left. Did you have a question, Pete? Well, it, it, it's a, I mean, it, it, yeah, it is a question in a way. Um, and it goes back to what Helen was asking before about uh, who who's thinks about actually making a farm start happen. Um, I think one of the things we need to do in County Durham is a, is a feasibility study, but it's on a county-wide basis. Mm -hmm. And if any of you are willing to share your feasibility studies, then that would be a really good start for me to um, just to sort of get the, 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 the right questions in into that um, into that document, if you like. I know I've got somebody who will pay for it, so that's a good start. Um, but I could do with a, a, um, a step up to make it happen. Yeah. Um... If you send me an email, Peter, what I'd suggest is if you join the Farm Start Network email list and send an email okay. about that, then um, that's probably a good way. Yeah, um, we'll do that. Yeah, because I can, I can definitely send you our Bristol one. Real. And also the guide, the guide that Steph wrote is mm. really, really good start. Um, can, brings loads of stuff. I don't think we ever did a feasibility study for Farm Start, hilariously. <laughs> in a world where you need to find um funding for these things having a feasibility study is a good start isn't it um and the the network that i'm sort of tapped into now is around um bishop auckland um which is having a lot of money thrown at it um part of this sort of red wall crumbling stuff in county durham um so there is money around to make some of this happen, um, but it needs to go through the right processes to to get to to the point of delivery. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thanks, everyone. I think we're uh, unfortunately out of time, um, but do please stay in touch. Um, I'll be. I mean, I'm doing the Farm Start Network job for a little bit longer. My email address is uh, possibly on, no, it's not on the uh, Farm Start Network site. So I'll stick it in the. Um, box as well so please do uh, get in touch with any questions um, the session will be available online I imagine at some point um, so yeah uh, thank you very much for everyone's questions and contributions it's been really really interesting thank you very much cheers thanks all thank, thank you. you look forward to a pint another time thanks very much. for sure for sure <laughs> oh well done